Pakenham to Pozier, Paddy's Peregrinations, Mouquet Farm, France, 1916. Just two weeks before the 24th Battalion, the red and white diamonds of the Australian Imperial Forces had suffered horrendous casualties taking the ridge at Pozier. It had been like a hell on earth. Now they were to relieve the 1st Division in trying to take the German stronghold of Mouquet Farm, or as the diggers called it, Mukau or Mucky Farm. The Germans were enraged at their defeat at Pozier and were determined not to let the enemy gain any more strategic positions on the Western Front. It was late afternoon on the 22nd of August 1916 and Private Number 2444, Charles Henry Shepherd, who stood five foot seven and a quarter with pale Celtic complexion, steel blue eyes, grey hair and a bushy moustache, peered with glazed eyes upward to the skies above, partly for divine inspiration, but also at the proliferation of enemy warplanes. It was then an intense barrage of shrapnel rained upon his sea company. It was relentless, and with it came explosives from overhead. The continual echoes of machine gunfire were only broken by the reverberations of the potato masher bombs. The quarry at Mukay Farm was littered with bodies, body parts, and the wounded. Private number 2444 was one of those injured. He had taken a severe gunshot wound to his left knee, making it a struggle to stay upright. Their guide had been killed and as the moonless night had descended, Charles Henry began crawling for the sanctuary of safety over bodies of men that only days before he had shared the success of capturing Pozier Ridge. The attack had lasted an agonising six hours, finally ceasing at midnight. Killock Northern Ireland, 1898. Charles Henry Shepherd was born to parents William and Margaret at the seaside village of Keelock in Northern Ireland. He would follow in his father's footsteps with a life of adventures and travel on the high seas as a merchant seaman. In 1898, he signed up as a crew member of the three-masted windjammer, the Dovenby. The owner of the ship was Peter Idale, a man considered by many not of impeccable standings. It was believed he had obtained his wealth from the slave trade by running black ivory from the Guinea coast to the southern states. With Patrick Fagan at the helm, they set sail from the Port of London to Sydney, Australia, an arduous journey of 84 days from the Downs. It was perhaps this visitation to Australia that would set Charles Hart on returning to its shores to establish a family. The Dovenby would sail onto Newcastle to load coal for its next destination, San Francisco. It wasn't until 1908 aboard the four-masted steel bark, the Iverna, mastered by Patrick Ryan and owned by slaters and slate merchants from Glasgow, A&D Mackay, that Charles would arrive back and be one of five members who would sign off. Paddy, as Charles was now affectionately known by his Australian mates, would struggle with civilian life, working as a labourer on the docks at the Port of Melbourne and spending periods of time out of employment. A problem with a demon drink a habit picked up on the high seas would see him in an altercation one night where he was stabbed from behind to his left shoulder. This would be the catalyst for a transformation for Paddy as the Salvos became involved in his rehabilitation. Pakenham, December 1914. In 1914, with the help of the Salvation Army, he found work at their men's home in Pakenham. The home began in 1892 after the state government of that time passed the Village Settlements Act. The Salvation Army, acting independently, secured 600 acres in Pakenham. This had been a dream of Herbert Booth, son of William Booth, father of the Salvation Movement, who believed therapeutic farms in the country could provide rehabilitation for ex-prisoners, the unemployed and those with drink problems. With the clearing of the property came the farm equipment, stock and young fruit trees, all which had been donated. In 1914, there were 80 acres of orchard. The home at this time was chiefly for men whose labouring days were over. At previous times, the home had cared for disenfranchised youth, and at one stage it was a girl's home. Although primarily now for the age, there was plenty of work required in maintaining and developing the orchard, and this would provide an outlet for able-bodied men who had found their way here for various reasons. The day Paddy arrived, the young Packenham bootmaker, Donald Dobson, also turned up. Donald was 21 years old, five foot eight of dark complexion and had brown hair and eyes. Donald had lost both parents when he was quite young and this had seen him struggle and find difficulties in his life. Paddy would help clear the land with a horse and plough 
and Donald would cultivate the fruit trees and help with irrigation. At about the same time on the 30th January 1915, fresh from a Salvation Army cadetship in Dover, Tasmania, a young army officer, Marjorie Agnes Marion Shelton Drysdale, was appointed to the Old Man's Paradise at Pakenham. Marjorie was the loving daughter of Scottish immigrants from Culross, Walter and Sarah. Marjorie was quite tall and a solid build. She had a dark complexion, long light brown hair, blue eyes and a heart of gold. Marjorie was raised on a sawmill owned by her father in Meads Creek, Port Esperance, Tasmania. She had inherited her father's passion and drive to see things through to their completion and in having a strong faith in the Lord. She was a perfect fit for this home. The Salvos believed the woman officer provided the aged men with a touch of comfort and charm that makes a difference between a home and an institution. Marjorie had also had working knowledge of an orchard as she had been living on her brother's orchard in Port Esperance. Marjorie would take both Patty and Donald under her wings. It was with her care and understanding that would turn both men's lives around. They would both enlist in the Australian Army, Donald on the 7th of July 1915, Patty three days later on the 10th. They were the fair dinkums, a term recently used to describe those who signed up with the knowledge of the atrocities at Gallipoli, unlike many of those first enlistments who ventured out on a boy's adventure. Paddy and Donald, with their newfound self-worth, would serve God and country, a God they had just found, a God who loved them regardless of their past and present shortcomings, and for Paddy, a country he now called home. Bristol, England, 2nd of September, 1916. Private Charles Henry Shepherd sat quietly in the courtyard of the Southern General Hospital in Bristol, recovering from his gunshot wound to the knee, reflecting in the afternoon sun on how he had managed to arrive back to the other side of the world. William, his younger brother, had visited that day, and together they chatted about the absurdities of war and of his comrades lost in battle. Paddy talked of the battle at Pozier and the significance of the Australians taking the ridge, but mostly of the losses in the ghostly giant mincing machine that war historian Charles Bean had called it. Bean would later say that Pozier is more densely sown with Australian sacrifice than anywhere on earth. There were more Australians killed there in such a short time than any other war battlefield. Gallipoli, although horrific and brave, came nowhere near. One in eight men who died in World War I died at Pozier. Private Charles Henry Shepherd would also confide to his brother of his affection for this amazing woman of God who had impacted his life and in the hope that there would be a day when they could reconnect. Postscript. Paddy would return to the front line in France on the 20th of January 1917 and be discharged on the 21st of September 1919. He would marry Marjorie Drysdale on the 24th of July 1918. They resided in Brunswick and had four sons, Charles, Walter, James, my father, and Albert, who would all serve in the Salvation Army. Private number 2862, Donald Dobson was a member of the 21st Battalion and was discharged with myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, on the 21st of August 1918. He would reside in Richmond and would die in 1926 at the young age of 34. Thanks and acknowledgement go to the Shrine of Remembrance, the Salvation Army Heritage Centre and the Berwick Pakenham Historical Society. Also thanks to Nathan Bell who provided the background music, just a young teenager he is, a very talented young lad and I thank him for that. Also for C.W. Bean for his AIF in France for 1916 and also the Red and White Diamond by Sergeant McCubbin. This Saturday, the 23rd of July 2016, commemorates the centenary of the Battle of Pozier and for the first time the 4,112 men never found or identified will rest in peace with a white cross placed among the 7,000 who died there.